Okay, it's good. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is February 5th, 2023, and we are broadcasting internationally. Uh, we are located in Houston, Texas, in Dawn Mountain, and Kai Sukoski is with us in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And it's my distinct and great pleasure to in introduce Dr. Kai Sukoski. She is an associate professor of art and design at the Lab for Living at Sheff Sheffield Hallam University in the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Kaisu is a cross-disciplinary artist with a background in performance, film, and biological materials. Now that is a stretch that you don't usually hear about. <laughs> she collaborates with, and again, here's a stretch, scientists, clinicians, and engineers focusing on the climate crisis, multi-species relationships, and the art science methodology. And this morning, uh, you know, we do a Dharma first Sunday. We usually have a special lecture, and we're experimenting with a slightly different form today. It's going to be a bit of a dialogue. Uh, Kaisu will present, and uh, then we will talk together. So... It is with great pleasure, Kaisu, it's yours. Mm, thank you, Horvila. Um, firstly, warm welcome to everybody, old and new friends and students. Um, it's, just, it's very precious to be here uh, to talk about some of my favorite topics, if not the favorite topics uh, of myself in my life. And to do that, with our beloved Lama Namgyal Dorje and also Rixin Droma is in the house. So how fortunate are we? And so I'm hoping to share something that's very dear to my heart, my work, my practice, and hoping this will be inspirational to you, beneficial to all beings. So next to those things that Harvey mentioned in my introduction, which is true. I am in some sense um, those things. Uh, but next to those things, I'm also a human animal. I'm a city reindeer and I have a mammalian body, which right now is responding to this situation with a pounding heart. There's quite some adrenaline and considering the topic of our conversation today, which is at large Buddhism and ecology, but specifically the notion of the wild, wildness, rewilding and culture, it seems appropriate to kind of acknowledge the mammalianness, plus I love the word, the sound of it, um, and it just uh, feels appropriate to acknowledge what's actually going on uh, as I speak from the heart as much as possible. So you could say that my domestication is not as nearly as complete as one might think. I'm responsive to situations like this and many others. So what we're discussing here today specifically is the relationship between cultivation and wildness. And we do that hopefully both from an internal perspective as well as external perspective as an environment um, and considering us both as practitioners but also as ecological beings. So um, we will be doing that by drawing from two main uh, sources one of which being my own um, environmental art practice uh, work and research I've done with the reindeer in the Arctic. And most inspirationally, the amazing oeuvre of Gary Snyder. Um, many of you might be familiar with his work. Um, amazing writer, poet, environmental activist, and a Buddhist practitioner as well. So. His work is really, really has been inspirational, but is 
I feel like it's nearly uh, life ta- life changing uh, in my practice and work. Uh, so I'm uh, going to share some um, aspects of it with you. But let us um, start by so Shane, if you could now show the picture I uh, sent beforehand. This is from my reindeer work, just as an origin for this talk. Um, so here you have myself and uh, going from the general as the reindeer into particular, his name is Hörö, um, can say that we really became friends. Uh, Hörö means something like pointy ears and at, at the same time alert listening. So um, that um, was somehow um, also present in his behavior. Uh, So the origin of this talk is really a month-long residency I did about a year ago, actually, in northern part of Finland. Um, This was filmed on um, traditional land of the Sami people. And really, the focus of this work was um, climate crisis in the Arctic region and the multi-species relationships um, in um, in relation to that. Um, so I had a privilege to work with the reindeer for many occasions there. And I'm going to show later a little segment of the film that resulted uh, from this trip. So Shane, you could now take this picture down again, um, since I'm now going to talk about Gary Snyder's work a little bit. So also going to scroll down my notes to get things as accurate as possible. So I'm especially drawing from this book, somehow felt like it's nice to have the actual book with me here as if I'm channeling it directly. I won't be able to, but I'm trying. So the book title is The Practice of the Wild. And that already brings in the two kind of, um, you could say often thought as polar oppositions, culture and wildness. But as you read it, as I read it, you realize how incredibly intertwined uh, cultivation and wildness are in various uh, fascinating ways. So let me just briefly start by like how Snyder defines culture uh, to get us kind of started um, into his uh, thinking and world. So by culture, He refers to deliberately maintained aesthetic and intellectual life. So actually the totality of socially transmitted behavioral patterns. And I just thought this alone is very, very interesting because most, so you could consider spiritual religious life also as a, such a kind of uh, socially transmitted behavior patterns. Um, And we as Western Buddhists typically are assimilating and up and adapting these patterns in later stage of life instead of being born into um, Buddhist uh, aesthetic and intellectual life. So we are in a way more consciously perhaps um, having an opportunity to go through such process more consciously than a child could, um, th- I might be wrong about this, by the way, anyways, but uh, that just came to my mind. But either way, practice, culture, they are, in my experience, related, practice being deliberately sustained and including conscious effort, actually, to do that. So in some, in this sense, and in some sense, culture seems to be moving away from natural processes. It seems to really, and in some ways it does, but not in all ways at all. So then looking into the meaning of the wild as Snyder defines it. So basically he starts by saying that the dictionaries typically define the wild from the human perspective and actually what it's not. Uh, So he wishes to reverse this and talks about several things. And all of this really can kind of start opening up the horizon, what what we understand with wildness and the benefits of it. So he talks about wild animals as free agents 
each with their own qualities. He talks about wild plants who are or which are self-propagating and self-maintaining. Snyder talks about land, wild land with original and potential flora and fauna. And finally, interestingly, also wild individuals who, whose behavior fiercely is resisting oppression, whose behavior is free and spontaneous, behavior that is unconditioned, expressive, and even ecstatic. So this goes against what most Western and also Eastern thinking uh, is kind of tied to what wild and wildness is. So when we're used to, or, or let, let's just say, sometimes we are thinking of wild wildness as something harmful, violent, disruptive. This is not the the manner I'm wishing to introduce those terms now um, in our conversation, especially because Snyder specifically connects the wild with the free and freedom. And so he goes on to explain that to be truly free, one must, must accept the conditions as they come, painful, uncertain, impermanent, sounds very familiar, right? So in this sense, to speak of wildness is to speak of wholeness. Like how beautiful is this? To speak of wildness is to speak of wholeness. And so he sees the wild actually impartially, relentlessly and beautifully formal and free. So this book, leaves us with a question, and it's a very literal question that is uh, I'm drawing from the book, but really is kind of reorganizing my view on my inner landscape and in relation to the external landscape. And that question is, how to cultivate a social and economic life that puts us in touch with the wild in ourselves and cultivates the wilderness around us as a place where the wild potential is fully expressed and diversity of living and non-living beings flourishing according to their own sorts of order. Their own sorts of order. So the fact that we as human animals don't understand necessarily the orderliness of the wild and wilderness doesn't mean that it's not there. So to then continue this and to continue thinking, how does then culture and wildness come together in practice. It's a beautiful thought, thought of wholeness uh, and so forth. But what, how does this manifest in our Western everyday life? So Snyder introduces three aspects of our culture that has a specific wild edge, as he calls it. And two of these are something that most of us can kind of imagine. It's not very, very surprising, but just bear with me. Anyway, they're all interesting. So the first one being the arts. So here Snyder is actually drawing from Claude Lévi-Strauss, who's written about the arts as a wilderness area of our culture. So you could say that Art um, is kind of a natural park of our culture where artists wish to kind of cultivate their own internal wildness, connect to the external wildness and invite other peoples to tune into theirs as well. Uh, so these are areas that actually willfully survive in the midst of the civilized minds very cultivated minds. 
The second area of our culture um, that has a wild edge, Snyder calls um, fourth lovemaking. As it's often sung, he calls lovemaking as a delightful, part of the delightful wild in ourselves. So this art, sex, um, is not really surprising, but could be interesting to explore. However, for the purposes of our talk today and purposes of, for us as Buddhist practitioners, um, the third one specifically gynomagnetized me. So, and also functions by now as a motivation for my practice. So the third aspect uh, of wildness in our culture, he calls uh, that self-realization and even enlightenment. So in Snyder's view, that is bonding of the wild in ourselves to the wild processes of the universe. Um, why does this magnetize me, inspire me, motivate me? Is maybe because in some very, very modest ways, I've in some practices, I've kind of felt this, there's a felt sense of this being even possible for me. Um, but it just um, the boundary between myself and um, the universe, as he says, it seems to like, like the potential of that boundary blurring and dissolving just um, seems amazing to me. So these three aspects, I would say, um, are something that that we can choose to explore and especially the third aspect uh, in, in this context. And now since I am an artist and um, I wanted to share a segment of my reindeer film as well. So we can also think of the arts as a wilderness area in as well. So um, now actually Shane, if you would be so kind to prepare the two minute film segment um, so we could watch that together. So I'm just gonna say to transition from these, um, let's just use the art wilderness uh, as a bridge, uh, but it is also the film does include quite some cultivation uh, if you like. It does involve a dream world, which can be considered kind of one of our inner uh, wilderness areas uh, as well, I think. But so this um, film is actually nearly 10 minutes long and I now just uh, for this talk um, edited a short uh, clip of it to give an impression. The film is called The City Reindeer. It's filmed uh, in Northern Finland a year ago, like I mentioned. And um, so Shane, whenever you're ready, we can watch that, please. More than a question of carbon reduction, the climate crisis is a relationship problem. By making real and imaginary offerings, I'm setting up a stage, a possibility to begin healing this relationship, starting with my relative, the reindeer. I have conducted a series of picnics, inviting the reindeer and eventually any other being to join. Part of this method included leaving the plate outside for the night and I returned to check whether anybody has visited it. I returned the next morning and the plate was untouched. One time my picnic was completely gone. I forgot where it was and couldn't find it back. This allowed me to practice in an embodied manner 
some of the basic practices and activities reindeer continuously conducts, digging food under snow. Understanding reindeer includes understanding of elements such as wind. As the sun unevenly heats the planet's surface, air rises and sinks, resulting in high and low regions of air pressure. As air rises, the pressure lowers and surrounding air moves in to replace it. This flow is called wind. Both the sun and the earth are needed to create the wind. The wind is born from the encounter of the sun and earth. I fell asleep and dreamt of a reindeer. Thank you, Shane. Uh, so there's a bit of a cliffhanger there now, and um, I might note at this point that we are hoping to deliver a part two of this talk, maybe sometime in June. So stay tuned. Uh, at this point, I would like to hand it over to Harvila, if you would be so kind to. Did you want to reflect in any way what I shared? I think reflect is the perfect word uh, for your presentation, because I think part of what you're talking about are multidimensional reflections uh, in every sense of the word. Uh, I'm just so impressed with how the metaphors and images that you're presenting all reflect one another in very, very profound ways. And I, I think that uh, just um, maybe my first foray into this area with you together would be how uh, Snyder, who Ann and I saw in 1970, one of our dates at the University of Wisconsin, he did a poetry reading, which was, of course, fantastic. And I think it included some Sanskrit and Chinese and Japanese, maybe. And we were at the time studying Sanskrit, of course. So it was wonderful. Um, very, very alive, uh, creative. I think everything you're saying is permeated by interpenetration and and the poet is calling us to allow the reflection of outer and inner and your presentation so beautifully um and your voiceover you know as you're describing how wind arises in a very kind of scientific, uh, clear way, you're also illustrating, reflecting the nature of wind. And uh, so the porosity is a, is a word that arises for me in terms of uh, inspiration and understanding. So I'll just play that back to you and see if you want to share anything on the basis of what I just said. <laughs> well, I mean, to be honest, as an artist, it would be wonderful to say that I read the book and then I went there and it just became part of the film. Actually, I read the book after my trip, but it's still magical how things then can come together in some. So actually, the order of things sometimes doesn't, it's not all of it. So things coming together is is the most important part. Um, so whether it's intentional um, or not, I also do agree that the aspects of it do create a dialogue. I was wondering, Harvey, if you were willing to say anything about, because earlier we discussed this, 
relationship between cultivation and practice. And if we take Snyder's third point, the, the ultimate self-realization would actually be connecting yourself with the wild processes of the universe. So maybe this is very, very, you know, <laughs> simple for everybody else. But for me to put it like this, that there's can, there can be so much cultivation towards wildness, that wildness is not, we're not natural in wildness, if you put it like this. Yeah, so I think it's actually a, an enormously rich uh, topic. Um, just to say a little bit about this, one of the aspects of Dzogchen teachings is talking about dynamism, energy, and um, in some ways, one could say that practice is, dare I say, coming to grips with dynamism in the sense of really understanding the nature of dynamism and ultimately, of course, being able to embody free dynamism. The puzzle of bondage is that we take the effects of dynamism to be separate from ourselves and the fruits of realization are to understand how all dynamic display is really the expression of our deepest nature you know there there are so many rich words in tibetan buddhism and in buddhism and sanskrit and tibetan but one word that I, I actually love and have only really come to understand within the last year is, um, I said this yesterday when we were teaching, they describe yoga as nel jor. Jor means to unite, but the word nel means authentic and real. And so the practice of yoga is coming in touch with your authenticity. And I, and I feel that what you're talking about resonates so beautifully with that idea that that our that our quest our innate quest is fueled by a sense of there's something more authentic more real more alive that we can come to touch and one way that people certainly touch it is by being in nature and being close to nature and reflecting on nature and cultivating a relationship with nature. Um, there's so much in what you bring up in terms of the aspect of cultivated wildness. But I think in some ways that is in fact the, the essence of the spiritual path is the practices, as in the title of the book, that allow us to be in touch with that authentic alive, wild, inner nature. I am unfortunately a little bit aware of our time constraints, but I think we, uh, in our planning, Kaisa, we did this beautifully. We, <laughs> we kind of nailed it in terms of what we could put into 30 minutes. And uh, yes, uh, let's, let's make a date for June where this will be continued, this conversation. Um, I hope we'll see more. I think we will see more reindeer on that occasion. Yes. <laughs> and I, I just thank you from my heart. Uh, what you're exploring is so rich, meaningful, and helpful and rewarding. So thank mm. you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And you were right about the time. And I wanted to say too much. So let's uh, continue in part two in June. And I hope that everybody um, found something inspirational in this talk and hope to see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a minute or two, a break. Uh, some people may need to leave. Uh, and Shane will need to reset up the uh, YouTube for the next event. So we'll take a minute or two. We'll be back in... Thank you. Two minutes. Thank you, Kaisula. Really wonderful. 
we will invite people to we'll watch this on YouTube so they can prepare for the tumor. And do you have your mic?